Howdy again, it's Mrs. T. Week two, lesson two in cultural geography class. We're still on the really basics of human geography, cultural geography, and the themes that we use when we are studying our topics this semester. So we need to talk about the five themes of geography. These five themes are always part of the answers to our why of where questions that we ask in geography class. Okay, so the five themes of geography are easy to remember if you organize them in this acronym, Mr. Help. Do you see how I've got that down the board right here? Mr. Help, there are five themes of geography and typically we don't talk about them in this order. Um, typically we start with location and place and kind of move backwards on this Mr. Help thing to try to um, understand the relationship and the connection among these different concepts. But Mr. Help, if you can remember that fellow's name, he's there to assist you in remembering what these five themes of geography are. Okay, so M, movement, region is the R, human environmental interaction, those two things go together, the H, E in help. Um, L is location and place. So let's talk about location and place first because they're sort of the easiest to um, wrap your brain around. They're not uncomplicated, but they are the least complicated to explain, in my opinion, and apparently your textbook author's opinion, because I believe that they also re reorganize. They don't put the discussion in the textbook in this order. They uh, reorganize it so that they start with location first, I believe. This is all in chapter one of our human geography textbook. Okay, so location is either a precise spot or a general spot that we are talking about in our mental or cultural landscape. Okay, or physical landscape. So location has two sides to it. You can be talking about an absolute location like your GPS program typically uses in your phone when you ask, you know, find me directions to UAPTC. The address will be the precise location and it actually has um, minutes, degrees, and seconds, latitude and longitude points that can precisely pinpoint where you are at any given time. If you use Snapchat, there's a program on your phone that literally will show you or your um, avatar standing on the particular street corner where you are or even down to the room where you are in your apartment. It can give an absolute location. So by the way, um, I didn't say this at the very beginning, but if you have written all of this down like this in your notes, underneath all of this, give yourself some additional space and rewrite things like location and take notes on what it is that I'm telling you about because you're gonna need this information for our first 25 point discussion activity that comes up next week, okay? So make sure you take good notes, okay? Stop right now and redesign it if you, um, if you have already written this and didn't leave yourself some room to explain. Okay, so location, remember it's about precise, a precise spot or um, a general spot in uh, the landscape, whether we're talking about the physical landscape, the cultural landscape, um, or our mental landscapes. So absolute location can be pinpointed with latitude and longitude. I will post a picture in Blackboard of the latitude and longitude lines and show you how they are measured um, across the globe. So we have latitude lines that run from the equator at zero up to the North Pole, down to the South Pole and they have minutes, degrees, and seconds. Those are the divisions in the latitude and longitude lines so that across the map, across the globe, there is a grid that you can pinpoint precisely where the location is, the absolute location of something. X marks the spot, so to speak, in all those cartoons from the 1970s where they were searching for buried treasure, okay? The relative location is a general idea of where something is. Oh, you need to go to the post office? Well, I know that there's one right across the street from the Taco Bell on X Avenue. 
right? So there's a general location or a relative location of where you can find um, a Taco Bell and a post office, whichever one you might need. In general, when we have a lot of familiarity with our local sphere, our local culture scape, and where it is that we um, operate on a daily basis, it's typically relative location that we keep in the forefront of our minds. We have a lot of interaction, however, with absolute location. If you use your GPS as much as I do, um, or even if you use um, the grid lines and locations on some of the interactive video games that you probably are part of. Fortnite uses um, absolute location within their uh, fictitious world that you are um, operating in, in Fortnite. So location is um, an easier, it's one of the easier concepts of Mr. Help to understand. And so we start with that. And then the next one is place. The next one that we're going to go to is place. Now a place, this is about adjectives really. Um, it's different than location because we are talking about a spot that you can either pinpoint or you can generally describe on a map or a grid or in your mental scape of where you are. A place is different because we're talking about adjectives that describe either the physical characteristics or the human characteristics that exist somewhere. So for instance, the South, look at my air quotes when I put the word South or say the word South, the South is a place that has a human or a cultural characteristic of a particular kind of pronunciation of the English language. So the South is a place where you could expect to find a particular pronunciation of the English language. Um, Arkansas is a place that has lots of lakes and rivers within it. The northwest part of the state is mountainous. So I'm describing the physical features of the place. The cultural landscape is the, in, um, the way that humans have modified that location, perhaps for their um, own purposes or perhaps unintentionally. And the physical landscape is also something that we talk about when we are describing place. Again, to use video games, especially these uh, video games where you build your own world, you build your own empire or whatever, um, all these, all, whatever the things are that you do in these fictional places, typically you will see a thought process going on in people's minds when you're choosing a location to build your city or build your factory or build your uh, metal works or you know your fuel systems or whatever. You choose the location to put these things based on the description of the place. If you need transportation to be easy, you will probably build it close to a water source like a river. As a matter of fact, when we get to the agricultural section, we will talk a lot about physical descriptions of places where agriculture began in the world. Agriculture wasn't just bingo there from the very beginning it took human environment interaction with the physical features of the place the climatological features of a place and those locations that favored agriculture that human environment interaction part um, began to see agriculture take over as the food getting strategy and therefore it was a hearth of agriculture here is a cultural geography word a cultural hearth um, is a the origin place where some sort of cultural trait began and typically diffusion happens from those particular locations. I have gotten so far ahead of myself because just in um, that explanation of physical characteristics and cultural characteristics of place, I've already branched out into human environmental interaction and also movement because diffusion or things moving from a hearth of origin into, you know, outer regions. Look at me, I'm all over the place with our five themes of geography. But it's good that I can show to you early on that even though we have different sections in our textbook for each one of these things, and even though we knew 
enumerate them, the five themes of geography, we have to synthesize these concepts constantly because they are all connected. They're all connected and that's part of what we have to do. We have to wrap our brain around the interconnectivity of all of these different things when we are studying the different topics that we're going to look at, such as agriculture. Can you tell that that's coming up pretty soon? When we get to the population chapter, we're gonna look at the, that kind of thing. Okay, so there's location, there's place. Make sure you have all those descriptions in your, in your notes. Physical features, which would include mountains or lakes or streams or deserts, ice caps, these kinds of things would be physical features. Uh, the physical features, however, could also be things that human beings have placed in the landscape. So the physical features could be Mount Rushmore, which is a mountain, but it has the work of art that captures some of United States heritage in the examples of the people's faces that were put on that mountainside. So um, human environmental interaction is also another thing that has multiple facets to it. There is a back and forth in human environmental interaction. The environment, of course, brings with it its certain characteristics of place. Arkansas has four seasons of the year. Summer seems to be the harshest. Winter seems to be the shortest. And because of those kinds of things, humans interact with the environment in Arkansas by building certain types of houses that can protect them from the extremes of those weather conditions. Because of this, the environment also changes. When we built the house that I'm living in now, we needed to shore up the environment and put a retaining wall and put drains and all of this kind of stuff because the place where we wanted to put our house required that we do this in order to maintain the house over time. Some places in Arkansas are so close to the sea level, you will not see basements. Why would that be? Why, where? we're talking about would not have a basement. Well, if the water table is up that high, you're not gonna dig into the ground to have living space or storage space because it will flood all the time. If you go closer to the Mississippi River Delta, you will even see homes built on stilts because of the expectation of the river rising so much that it might flood. And that therefore, you know, you're gonna keep your living space out of, um, out of the way. There's dams on the Arkansas River that that's human environmental interaction to um, change the way that the river flows and change the likelihood of catastrophic floods. There was a catastrophic flood in the in the late spring, I guess you would say, of 2019 anyway, along the Arkansas River. There was so much snow melt in Colorado where the source is, listen to these places and these locations, the general, the relative location, Colorado, where the source of the Arkansas River is, snow melt, which was a, a physical description of the environment, tons of snow there, melted so much that it came down and flooded the Arkansas River anyway um, from Oklahoma on the way here because um, the human environmental interaction did not take into consideration that we needed to keep up our levees or um, perhaps have additional spillways or something like that. So there, this is a give and take. It's, I've got written here a back and forth, but when humans alter the environment, the environment changes also, and then humans have to react. And so there's the activity that is part of the behavior side of cultural geography. Okay, and then when the environment changes, then we can talk about some different physical uh, descriptors for the particular place we're talking about, different cultural descriptors for the particular place we're talking about. Um, all of these are interconnected. Okay, now regions become an important part of mental concepts and uh, governmental policy political concepts when human populations expand.
So we're going to start with our um, food getting strategy and our human culture chapters. We're going to start with talking about the origins of human societies when populations were very, very small. And then why did populations have the opportunity to expand? Well, we had human environmental interaction that increased the food production, increased the yield, and therefore places began to support larger numbers of humans. And so regions began to develop where you had formal regions, such as if you're into politics, think of geopolitical borders. A geopolitical border is, for instance, if you can imagine a picture of the state of Arkansas, which you have at least seen that before on a weather report, um, Channel 7 News weather report. Um, you're gonna, you can see the, the radar, right, of where the weather system is coming in. Those geopolitical boundaries indicate a formal region where the government of Arkansas has jurisdiction where the economy of Arkansas or your Medicare card or your Medicaid card or your EBT card, these kinds of things that are issued through your political unit are good in those particular counties, those particular um, formal regions that have borders that we can show on a map. There are also, that's just one example of a formal region. There's many more examples that you can read about in your textbook. There are functional regions also. So for instance, if there are trade agreements, I'm stuck on political um, geopolitics right now, if there are trade agreements, like we've heard a lot about um, a trade agreement called the North American Free Trade Agreement that was um, written out of law with the recent presidential administration, or, um, you know, the, the well, I can't remember the name of the Canada Mexico America agreement that is in place right now. Those are functional agreements because they allow for human environmental interaction and also movement of people, things, and ideas across geopolitical borders based on economic um, an economic community that is agreed upon. So there's a functional region. Or if you have a service area for your cell phone coverage, for instance, there's a functional region. It might span from Arkansas to Louisiana and Texas, so it doesn't abide by the formal geopolitical borders, but there's a functional region where you're not roaming or where you don't have extra charges, these kinds of things for a cell phone service, for instance, or um, the UPS route that uh, the, the men in brown uh, drive in order to deliver packages. There's going to be a functional region. Your school buses drive in a functional region to get from point A to point B in this particular um, place, in that particular location. There's also perceptual regions. And sometimes perceptual regions are a little bit more complicated. Well, they are always more complicated because what you see as a region, as like a descriptor for a region or what you see as a grouping of places and locations that make up a region, I might not agree with and vice versa. So for instance, there is a perceptual region that maybe you've heard about before called the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt is a perceptual region that describes a zone in the United States roughly along the center of the country, the eastern and central part of the country, that's a, literally a belt shape, as though the United States on the map had a belt on. And in those states that make up this perceptual region, typically religious practice and religious belief, not just any religious practice or any religious belief, but Protestant faiths, um, typically have a very, very strong cultural presence in the daily lives of the people who live there. If you ask people to talk about where is the Bible Belt, where are the boundaries of the Bible Belt, if you have 10 people in the room, there's probably going to be 10 different ideas about where exactly the boundaries of this perceptual region are. It's not something that's defined through geopolitics. It's not something that's defined through 
a UPS route. It is something that in our mental idea of and our knowledge of the cultural characteristics of place, a general region of this belief system, these habits on a daily basis, these laws, these practices, that kind of thing are part of a perceptual region. So region gets um, to be a little bit more philosophical when we're talking about, um, just like relative location can be a little bit more philosophical than a precise pinpointed place on a map. Okay, movement is also part of uh, Mr. Help. It's the first one if you use the acronym, but it's perhaps the most complicated one of all. I, I, don't, I don't know, human environment interaction and movement, they're pretty complicated, but all of them have elements of each other within a thorough understanding of each of these five themes of geography. So movement is, of course, a transport of people, things, or ideas across space and also across time. Now, I'm not getting sci-fi with you right here, but think about time capsules or think about things that are launched into space and how perhaps time does not pass in the same way um, in space as it does here on the planet. So movement of people, of course, occurs on a micro scale, simply within a household or within a neighborhood or within um, a city. But movement of people also happens on a global scale when we're talking about transportation systems that can take us hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles within just one day. So people move, of course, from place to place, from absolute location to absolute location, and they interact with their environments, whether it is a physical or a social environment that we're talking about, once they get to the different region that they're going to, but people can move. And when people move, they take things with them. When they take things, whether it's things to sell, which we call goods, typically, um, and I, I believe that's the term that you will read in your textbook when you're reading the movement section, goods are exchanged from one place to the next. So there's movement of people, goods, and also ideas. You're watching YouTube right now and simply listening to this lesson on geography is a transportation, is movement of ideas from me to you. When you are in an interactive game room and you are texting with somebody in Berlin or South Korea or Moscow or wherever it is that your, you know, the people in your interactive game are located, you are transporting ideas from one place to the next. Movement is what causes cultural traits that originate in what we call a cultural hearth. Movement is what happens, is, is how those cultural traits are passed and expand through a concept called diffusion from one place to the next. Typically, when things diffuse from the cultural hearth into, the, into other locations in the region, into functional or perceptual regions, when humans interact with those cultural or physical traits that are brought into a region from someplace else, typically there's a little bit of um, purity lost in the original um, concept or in the original idea. Uh, and changes can be made, adaptations can be made. Human environmental interaction is about adaptation to the environment. It is about um, interaction with ad adaptation and modification of the environment. When cultural traits become part of the social environment, a lot of adaptation happens, a lot of modification happens, and these ideas that originated in one location might have been imported to another location but change in some of their basic concepts. Um, for instance, I have a very good friend from Japan and she has moved from Japan to the United States. This is her permanent home now. Uh, but just because she has moved from there to here does not mean that she prefers to use a knife, fork, and spoon at the dinner table like I do. She uses chopsticks. And so these things that she has to have as part of her cultural habits, these things have become part of my kitchen 
drawer also so that when she's here with me, she feels most comfortable when we share a meal together. So there's a simple micro scale example about how things can be imported from one place to the next and can be adapted into somebody else's, mine, my environment that were never there before. I knew what chopsticks were, I learned how to hold them before, but I never really had a functional use for them within my household. And now, based on what she, how I watch her use these things and how I see her um, use these things, um, when I have to reach down into the olive jar or the pickle jar or whatever it is, instead of getting a fork out or a spoon, which I never get very many olives or pickles out that way anyway, I grab the chopsticks that I have, an extension of my fingers, I reach down in, I pick one up and pull it out. And it's like clean fingers <laughs> going down in there. Um, and so there's different habits that I have adopted from her that have diffused from her cultural habits to mine. This is one micro scale example between two friends, but this happens on a cultural basis also, on a large scale basis. I believe the example, one of the examples of diffusion that's used in the textbook is McDonald's. Um, because in some places, for instance, you know, beef is a big deal at McDonald's and at USA folks, we love our beef. However, in India, India has a religious system that typically prohibits, not typically, always, if you follow the religious system, beef is prohibited in their religious system and therefore in their food ways, beef is not part of the perception of what you can eat because it has a different function in the religious context. So McDonald's is a global corporation. It started in the United States, so beef is a big deal. But when it diffused into India, which has a huge population, and since McDonald's is a for-profit company, they want to take advantage of the profit they can make in that huge population, but they can't sell beef. So what are their burgers gonna be made out of? So veggie burgers, chicken, pork, what are these things gonna be, you know, how are we going to change the McDonald's formula so that it's sort of McDonald's, but for an Indian cultural place, right? Or in Saudi Arabia, for instance, um, where pork is not allowed uh, and dogs also are not um, allowed, they're haddam or dirty, they're forbidden. Um, a hot dog that's made out of pork, you can't have the name hot dog and you can't have the pork ingredient. And so they have different names and different ingredients for something that for you and I looks like what we call a hot dog. So diffusion can bring changes to original cultural characteristics so that regionally there's a different concept of what these things are for, what these cultural traits are for. People begin to adapt to the social environment um, of one place to the next and of each other when we interact with each other. And all of this happens on a global scale. And this is kind of a long video, so let me stop very soon and tell you that additional videos in our uh, folder for this particular week will not come from me, but I've got two other videos that you're going to watch. One of them is from a high school teacher, I think he's in Nebraska, who applies these Mr. Help concepts to some video games that he plays. Remember, we have to learn how to apply our knowledge um, to real life scenarios. So I'm going to show you a, a way that he applies these Mr. Help concepts to Minecraft, the, a video game that some of you perhaps um, play yourself, and then another just general um, geography information video that goes along with these introductory concepts. So please text me with any questions that you have and use any of these topics from video one, video two, or the other two videos that, I've that I mentioned to you just now, or any concept from chapter one for your week two reaction paper. And I will look for your text. Please don't forget, don't be a stranger, bye.